It's always great to be in the house of the Lord and worshiping the Lord, regardless of what special weekend or not special weekend it may or may not be. Uh, This morning, we're excited because we can extol the greatness of God, and we can talk about the fact that God is great, and he continues to bless in so many ways. He continues to um, demonstrate that greatness in this world in which we live um, on a daily basis. And it's, um, it's really neat to, to stop and to consider um, what God has, has truly done. I think of um, this message that I typically preach uh, this time of year on 4th of July weekend. I oftentimes will do a message that I entitle The State of the Church, and I am not doing that this morning. I usually bring in some of the things that are happening in the world in which we live and how it impacts the church and so forth, uh, but it's frankly just too discouraging. So um, I just... (laughs) I decided to bail on that topic this morning and, um, and actually uh, cause us to look at uh, Psalm 145, verses 1 through 4. I mean, this is a great passage of Scripture. I'll extol you, O my God, and I'll bless your name forever and every, every day I will bless you. And I'll praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. This is the verse I want you to pay attention to, verse four. One generation shall praise your works to another and that, and shall declare your mighty acts. This morning, what I want to do, it's my intention today to uh, truly praise God and seek to declare God's mighty acts. For when we think of the United States of America, we think of on this date, um, as we celebrate the 4th of July weekend, We think of the Declaration of Independence, and we think about how amazing it was that this country was able to uh, create, uh, in essence, a a new nation that would have at its core a fundamental belief in Almighty God. And not just an Almighty God, but the Almighty God, the only one true living God. And it somehow fitting for us this morning as we stop and we think about some of these great things that God has done to stop and give pause and just be able to pull apart um, aspects of the Declaration of Independence that were written with the sole intention of making this a book that, or making this a, a piece of paper that reflects the book of the Bible, that we might be able to have a nation that is founded, truly founded, on biblical principles. So let's look to the Lord in prayer today and may he bless our time. Father, we thank you that you truly are the author of the true only inspired book in the universe, the Bible. How we thank you, Father, that you have revealed yourself to us through it. And Lord, we thank you that, Father, the wisdom of the founding fathers of this country we're willing to take a very close look at these scriptures and make certain that the nation that they were being led to found would reflect principles and beliefs that are written there in your word. Help us, Father, to declare the mighty works that you've done. When we think of world history, we can go all the way back to the beginning of time, and we can think through, and we can read, and we can praise you for the great things that you've done. But today, help us, Father, to praise your name for the working in the hearts of men that made possible this great nation of which we are today a part. May you bless as we pull these things apart. May you be glorified in all of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our governor, Governor Hogan, wrote and he said, it somehow feels fitting for the 4th of July weekend that the oldest state house in the nation was hit by lightning but saved by a 208-year-old original Ben Franklin lightning rod. (laughs) And so the thunderstorm that happened the other day, it struck the state house, as you may know, and uh, it caused the sprinkler systems to come on in the dome. It was not a good thing. But this is what he said in in his Twitter. He He said, the rod atop the state house was constructed and grounded to Franklin's exact specifications. And the use of it was, in some respects, a political statement expressing support for Franklin's theories on the protection of public buildings from lightning and the rejection of opposing theories supported by King George III. I thought that was good. 
Well, we live in a nation that is obviously transitioning. There's a lot that is happening in our country. We think of the Declaration of Independence. It's uh, truly the document upon which uh, the founders of our nation would write the Constitution. It is so indoctrinated with a biblical worldview that the Declaration of Independence would be controversial if we read it aloud in most of our public schools today. It is without a doubt entrenched in biblical reality. Samuel Adams wrote this, and he, I just want to point out a couple of things. He says, let the divines and the philosophers and the statesmen and the patriots unite their endeavors to renovate the age by impressing the minds of men with the importance of educating their little boys and girls, of inculcating in the minds of youth the fear and love of the deity. And later on in that same section, he talks about greater, small, and short, of leading them in study and the practice of exalted virtues of the Christian system. You see, this nation was truly, and he's the, the father of the revolution, as he's called, it was truly in, through, and through a nation that had as its bedrock Christian principles. A 19th century Spanish statement came here to America, and he traced America's source to one book. Do you know what the book was? The Bible, exactly. In 1892, the Supreme Court unanimously concluded without qualification that this is a Christian nation. Well, the popular assumption today is that it's not a Christian nation. In fact, they would look at the U.S. as a populist nation that is inspired by the best human reason from 18th century enlightenment, not by political ideas that were anchored in the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century at all. And even if you were to go over and look at the, the statement there about the European Union, you would find the same things written, that it's all about this 18th century age of enlightenment and how human reason has really pressed upon society the reason for who we are today. There are views against Christian, uh, the fact that it is a Christian nation, that we are founded on Christian principles. Oftentimes people will look to uh, the idea that the founding fathers weren't believers, but they were deists. You hear a lot about that. However, you have to look very close and you have to be very careful not to buy into a lot of the revisionist history that you hear talked about today. In fact, the revolution itself is viewed by many as being, unfortunately, uh, in some people's minds, it was, it was unscriptural. Romans chapter 13, they quote in 1 Peter chapter 2, which are reasonable passages of scripture, I will grant you that they could look at. And we'll take a look at those this morning just briefly. But what is it with the documents that we hold so precious, the Declaration of Independence? How about the Constitution of the United States? In many people's regards, these are not sources that they want to keep. In fact, there are some on the Supreme Court today who would love to see the Constitution of the United States replaced. I came across this, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You may have heard of her. She's a Supreme Court justice. She was asked when Egypt was looking to rewrite their constitution if Egypt should take a look at the U.S. Constitution. And she said she would not recommend the Constitution as a model for Egypt's government. Instead, she would say the problem, you see, is that the U.S. Constitution is a rather old constitution. And I would say there's a lot of things that are old that aren't bad. How about Ben Franklin's lightning rod? And after all, I'm old and Ruth is old. You see, she suggests rather they should look to South Africa's constitution or the European Convention on Human Rights. That, in her mind, would be better. South African's constitution is well over 100 pages long. It's filled with tables. There's 
schedules and such stirring passages as detailed provisions for a financial and fiscal commission. A national legislation referred to in subsection one must provide for the participation of A, the premiers in the compilation of a list envisioned in subsection one B, and B, organized local government in the compilation of a list envisioned in subsection one C. And I, every word, in the Declaration of Independence, every word in the US Constitution is very, very well thought out. And it makes it very, very unique. This country was founded on Christian principles, but the founding was not something that was taken lightly. Stop and I think about the questions that could be asked. Did the colonists, for instance, have the right to resist civil government? When my wife was in Bible Institute uh, in the church where I was in seminary, she took a class and the teacher divided the class in half for the end of the year project and half of the class had to write on whether or not the, they, their positive view towards the uh, revolution, that the colonists had the right to revolt. The other half of the class had to say no and prove their reasoning behind it as well. What affected the colonists in such a way was what do we do in this situation? How do we handle this now? Um, do we have the biblical right to be able to resist the king of England? And the colonists work through this in a lot of different ways. John Calvin is credited with doing a lot of work back in the 1500s on this whole issue, and he developed a doctrine called, as you can see it there, the doctrine of interposition. Interposition means the resistance to tyranny through lower magistrates. And the theory was put into practice first in the 13th century, long before Calvin came on the scene. There were barons and there were bishops. They combined forces to resist King John, and it gave birth to the Magna Carta. Have you heard of the Magna Carta? It gave the King of England a choice of either affirming the known rights by means of a written compact or, and ending the oppression of the church by the state or facing armed resistance, which they themselves would lead. Well, that was interesting. That's back in the 13th century. By the 16th century, uh, the Protestant Reformation is taking place, and Calvin begins to do a lot of work, and he's beginning to look at Romans chapter 13. If you take your Bibles and you go with me there to Romans chapter 13, I want you to see some of the issues that were affecting them as they came to the Scripture to try to determine, do we have the right or do we not have the right to revolt from England? In chapter 13 here of Romans and verse one, and we'll look at verses one and two, it says every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there's no authority except from God and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon God themselves. Well, that's a, a pretty strong statement, is it not? And truly, it's going to present a problem for any theologian who is asked the question as to whether or not there is any wiggle room in Romans chapter 13 for there to be any type of revolution. Calvin develops this, and it's furthered by his followers as time went on. In the 1500s, after Calvin, late in the 1500s, 1579, the Huguenots were the first people to apply Calvin's exegesis of Romans chapter 13. What well, was Calvin's exegesis? Well, what he wrote was basically, it is true that we must come under and submit ourselves to human government. After all, human government is created by God. And under that human government, what Calvin saw as he looked at this was in the case of a tyrannical ruler, there could be lower magistrates who the power basically had shifted to. Calvin was very careful to say that there is not the right of the individual to revolt against the government, 
but a lower magistrate could take up the cause for the people to revolt against the tyrant. And in this situation, it would be the king of England. So 1579, the Huguenots are having trouble. They're going to apply this teaching. And what they did was they came to challenge the claim of absolute rule by the royalists in France. They issued the famous, and my French is terrible, Vindice contra Tyronis. My wife, I told her what I was saying. She said, sounds Italian. <laughs> so it literally means a defense of liberty against tyrants. Um, the principles were picked up. They were later used by John Knox in Scotland and then by Rutherford in his book, if you've heard of the book Lex Rex 1644. That's an old one. But here's what's interesting is as you go through the, this doctrine of the revolution, Adams attests that this Vindice was one of the most important volumes um, that was going around circulating in the pre-revolutionary days. And in fact, people would just casually, can you imagine, by their fireplace, pick this, this writing up and read through it and study it. So the colonists were trying to determine, do we have a right to revolt and start a new country? And they were very, very careful in trying to determine this. Incidentally, this teaching was actually used uh, by the Whigs and the Tories as they came to uh, come against, actually, they were coming against uh, the King James uh, number two. They went to William of Orange and asked if he would support them. And in a sense, William of Orange then became the magistrate. Well, as time went on, the people here the colonists were very, very careful. Take your Bibles and look with me at Romans chapter 13 here a little bit further. In Romans 13, there is without a doubt some substantial teaching on the role of the government. It would say this, for rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior but for evil. And the question that Calvin would come up, and we don't have time to pull apart his exegesis, but it's worth noting, is what happens when the government is not, in the eyes of God, doing those things which are good anymore? Is it then the right of the people to seek magistrates so that they could revolt? It asks the question, do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what's good, and you'll have praise from the same. For it's a minister of God to you for good. Though the whole premise of the government is that human government is ordained by God, but it's also ordained with a function. And the function is to uphold righteousness and that which is good, not encourage evil. Notice verse 5. Therefore, it's necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, the wrath of the government that would come down upon you if you were to resist it, but also for conscience sake. And so for conscience' sake, they needed to be very, very careful. Now it's true, our founding fathers are considered magistrates. They worked, however, within a legal process. They appealed to the king of England time and again. And instead, the king of England continued to, to tax them and regulate them further. At one point, uh, they actually accused John Hancock of smuggling. Everybody knows he's into insurance. <laughs> the, king re, re, the king responded by shutting down all the tea industry and having a monopoly on tea, which that was a big deal. I wouldn't have cared too much, but if it was coffee, it would have been an issue. The Boston Sons of Liberty, you may recall, decided to take the tea and throw it into the harbor as a protest. It's interesting to note, though, with the Boston Tea Party, the only thing that was broken in the Boston Tea Party was one lock. There was nobody's arms broken. There were no punches thrown. There were no gunshots. It was a very nonviolent thing. And no less than Ben Franklin suggested that the tea should be paid for. After all, it was thrown into the drink. Remember, the colonists were very, very careful. They wanted to have a clean conscience, and that was the most important thing, that they have a clean conscience before God. You can see their dilemma. Some early colonists actually volunteered to pay for that tea that was thrown into Boston Harbor. And you know what the king told him? He told him to get lost. 
you're not going to pay for that. Instead, he imposed what was called the intolerable acts. It took away Massachusetts' right to rule themselves, took away their rights to own firearms, placed an enormous number of soldiers, British soldiers, in Boston and the outlying areas, allowing them to be quartered in whoever's home they wished, gave them basically a free pass, get out of jail free card for any crimes that were committed. This was all going on during this time period. Meanwhile, the people are being very, very patient. This is 1775. And then Continental Congress decided to send to England the Olive Branch Petition, sent it to King George, and King George refused to even read it. It was never read. Instead, he declared the colonists to be in a state of open rebellion. The colonists are going to respond by explaining their actions to the world in what was known as the Declaration of the Causes and Necessity of Taking Up Arms. And this was a full year before the Declaration of Independence was even signed. You see, the colonists were were plotting in their methodology. They were very, very slow. And it was the king, not the magistrates, who were declared, who did the declaring of basically war. And when the king declared them to be in open rebellion, it set the stage for the American Revolution. Here it is in Romans. And so when the colonists went to sleep at night, they viewed the behavior as biblical, that there was some warrant for it in their mind. Now, when we think of the Declaration of Independence itself, it reads off, and you can see it there, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands or which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station in which, and you'll notice there, in which to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. Now there's a lot that's been written about this laws of nature and nature's God. Obviously there is one nature's God, that is Jehovah God. He is the true giver of laws. And it's important then for us to know and understand some things about these laws and nature's laws. Because when you stop and you think about this, the phrase, the laws of nature and nature's God, uh, was actually equivalent to another phrase that Blackstone used. You say, well, who in the world is Blackstone? Blackstone's a fascinating character. If you go back through uh, the early history, he wrote the encyclopedias on the laws of England. Those were still being used and probably are still used in law school today here in the United States. And so it was a a very valuable um, contribution to help understand what these laws are all about. John Locke, for instance, he came along, he was a Christian philosopher, had a lot of influence on America. He said the law of nature stands as an eternal rule to all men. Legislators as well as others, the rules that they make for others' men's actions must be conformable to the law of nature, that is, to the will of God. And so the whole concept was in the Declaration of Independence, what we're doing by declaring our independence in our minds comes under the umbrella of the law of God, i.e. the will of God. They were absolutely convinced that in stepping away from England, they, they were abiding in the will of God according to the laws of nature that God had ordained. Blackstone described the laws of nature and of nature's God in a chapter in his commentaries. He said, man is considered as creation and he must necessarily be subject to the laws of his creator for he is entirely a dependent being and consequently as man depends absolutely upon his maker for everything, it's necessary that he should in all points conform to his maker's will. Doesn't that make sense? If, if we are absolutely subject to the laws of our creator, We are totally dependent beings and we depend upon our maker for everything. This will of his master is called the law of nature. And so you can see how important it is. You can go back through and you can do your own study in in history on this subject and you'll find out that it's pretty amazing 
the time and attention that is given to this whole issue of nature's law according to the one true God of nature. And so I defer to God all of these truths. There is no such thing as mother nature. There is one God of nature. When the declaration's written and it comes up to the next part, it says there, uh, a decent respect to the original mankind requires that they should declare the causes. There's a whole list of causes that were written out about why they should pull apart. And it was well documented, but it was sealed in their minds in such a way that they believed before God that they were doing the right thing. And it's important to note this. Well, I want you to, to think through the Declaration of Independence with me. The transcript uh, says this. It says, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands that have connected them, and he goes on, he talks about the law of nature and, and entitling them. This is the part you and I tend to remember so well. We remember, we hold these truths to be Self-evident, exactly. So let's just take a moment and let's pull this apart a little bit. First off, he says, we hold these truths to be self-evident. There is, according to the colonists, an understanding that there is absolute truth. That there's not a moral relativism as in the minds of people today. Otherwise, if you believe in moral relativism, the Declaration of Independence has no merit because it starts right off by saying that we are holding these truths, these self-evident truths, and we're holding on to these things. For something to be self-evident, a truth first must be evident, amen? Amen. Take your Bibles and go back with me to Romans chapter 1. We hold these truths to be self-evident. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, it says this. For the wrath of God is received, or revealed rather, from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. And so what we have before us here is the evidence, because that which is known about God, verse 19, is evident. You see, the founders knew when they wrote the Declaration of Independence that they should put down that they know that these truths to be, um, that they're speaking of here, are self-evident. They're self-evident, and that's important because not everyone was a believer. Not everyone had faith in Jesus Christ. But their appeal was to the rank and file people just as normal people. And they really found the common ground, which the common ground is, we all know that there's a God who exists. We all know that there's a righteousness and an unrighteousness. We all know and understand that these things are reality. Let me just pause for a second and, and go down a rabbit trail for just a second. Even though God has revealed in nature and in the sky that there is a sovereign being, we still need Jesus Christ. There's a, a false teaching that's going around in our country today where people today are saying things like, well, I know, they'll be in, I know in heaven there'll be people that have never heard about Jesus, but they understood that there was a supreme being. I'm hearing it from different churches. I'm hearing it from different pastors. But the Bible teaches, especially as you go through and you develop the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 10, the Bible's gonna tell us very clear. Yes, it says whoever 
calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, but that is a responsibility for them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says very specifically, they need to hear about Jesus. They need to know and understand that Jesus died for them, that Jesus rose the third day. All of these things are the basis for our belief. There will not be one person in heaven who's there because they noticed that the moon really spoke to them one night about there being a, a, a supreme being. There will not be one person who saw an eclipse who said, you know what, I, I think there's a God. We need to let people know that the God of the universe has come. And in the person of Jesus Christ, he hung on the cross, he paid for our sin. And all he requires for us to benefit from that is a personal faith in him. Acknowledging that Jesus is God, that he is our savior, that he came with the understanding that he would die and pay the penalty of sin. But then he conquered sin and rose from the dead. You see, there's a lot of things that are self-evident. You could, you could have a, a, a great moment on top of a mountain that took you days to climb. But without Jesus, you'll never have salvation. Well, the founding fathers appealed to the fact that there is within man this self-evidence. In fact, it's amazing, but when you flip the page and you go over to Romans chapter 2, there's a couple of verses there in Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, which say this. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law, and he's speaking of the Jewish, the Old Testament law, he's saying these Gentiles, he said, they may not possess the Ten Commandments or the writings going back into Leviticus, but isn't it amazing, sometimes they do the things that are written in that law. He says the reason why, he says, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. You see, there is a working that God has placed in the hearts of men. It's called our conscience. And even among some of these Gentiles who have never heard of Jesus, who don't know anything about the Old Testament law, would be able to say, well, I do this or I don't do this because there's a sense of right and wrong. And this is to this point that the founding fathers are appealing, that people have as self-evident an understanding of what is right and what is wrong. And all of the laws of nature, all of nature's, a uh, uh, part of nature's God, who is the one true God, has instilled, even in the hearts of some that never heard the truth, uh, an understanding of what is right and wrong. The founding fathers appealed to that. Today we have a government that's making laws that are actually the opposite of this intention. And people who know in their hearts what is right and wrong, if their conscience has not been sealed, go ahead with those laws anyway. And my friends, I hear of it all the time. There, there are more laws coming that are worse than the ones that have already been passed. There are things being promoted today that you just, you know, if you imagine the worst 20 years ago, now they're here, they're knocking on a door. You see, the founding fathers appealed to this. And as we go through this, we, we look at the declaration that all men are created equal. Now, a couple things here, when you stop and you think that all men are created equal, they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are what? Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. We've got it down. See, we're great historical students. There are four principles that anchor the Declaration of Independence. Let me give you these four principles. Principle number one is that our rights come from God. Our rights come from God. The second point, principle is that the purpose of civil government is to secure those rights that come from God. The third point is the power of civil government is given by the consent of the governed each of whom is fully entitled to rule. And the fourth principle is the right to govern is forfeited by a tyrant to lower civil magistrates in order to restore the rule of law. Interesting. Now, when you stop and you consider the very beginning there when he says that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator, you know, words mean something, don't they? Words really do mean something. Uh, Jefferson, when he first writes the Declaration, 
had the word derived in there instead of the word endowed. But Benjamin Franklin and John Adams, okay, yeah, he's a deist. Well, listen, they replaced the phrase endowed by their, and put in there, endowed by their creator. And by replacing derived with endowed, the declaration finds itself resting upon rights as God had given them, not as how man understood those rights to be. Huge difference, huge difference. Later Congress, as they're working through this, they would insert the adjective certain in the place of Je uh, Jefferson's inherent. So they take out the word inherent, they put in there certain. Um, it, it's amazing the strength then of this document. When you couple those things together with the unalienable rights part, what God has given, this is the, the, the basis for it then, and the result of it is, it reads like this, what God has basically given for the benefit of all mankind cannot be taken away by the recipient or taken away by the donor. In other words, God has given certain, and he has endowed these certain unalienable rights and he's given them to individuals. This biblical principle carries all the way back, for instance, to 1 Samuel chapter 10, when the people of Israel are debating whether or not they want a king. And remember, they ratified the fact that they wanted a king. God said it wasn't a good idea, but they went and did it anyway. But they had the right to ratify that. And so the declaration starts with these rights that we have are from God. But then it says here that we're created. It says that all men are created equal. If you stop after the word created, you understand that the writers here had a general belief that God is the one who gave mankind all of these rights, and they use biblical terms to create, or to describe rather the origin of going all the way back to the book of Genesis. I believe that they believed that Genesis was true, and it was the creation account of the book of Genesis that really undergirds the laws of nature and of nature's God. Created equal. God has not created any different classes of people. There's no ruling class. There's no one who's entitled to rule. It's not as though there's a king and when the king dies, his son takes over and when his son dies, the grandson takes over. We're studying that on Wednesday nights with all of these different kings and the successions going on down through. It's not like that. The writers wanted to make it really, really clear that no one had the right to rule. God is the one who is ruling. We have been given rights and we understand that we all have those rights and we can go to the polls and we can elect who it is we want to rule over us. It might bother us that others don't vote the way we vote, but at the end of the day, we still have the right as a people to choose. He goes on and he talks about life and liberty and just very quickly as I wrap this up, life and liberty, I think of 2 Corinthians 3, 17, which is the verse they used often, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Pursuit of happiness reflects back on Ecclesiastes chapter three and also James chapter one. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father. And mankind would then have the opportunity to pursue those things that are beneficial and those things that would bring them blessing. As this early nation was founded, there was approximately two and a half million people here living in the colonies in 1776. 100 years later, time of the Civil War, there's 20 million people living in the United States. It went from two and a half million in 100 years to 20. Some would say that the time following the Civil War was one of the greatest times spiritually in the history of the United States. The bedrock had been laid, the, the, the declarations out there, the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, they're protecting, and Christianity begins to explode. In 1776, there was one clergy member for every 1,500 people in the United States. By the time of the Civil War, there was one for every 500 
Some of these were Methodist circuit riders. You see, their cities had churches and they had educated pastors and there were all these people out in the rural areas and these circuit riders took the gospel on horseback. And they'd go in, and I love that picture that where the circuit preacher has come to a house. Can you imagine you're living out in the middle of nowhere and all of a sudden somebody knocks at your door? Oh no, it's the preacher. He just came riding in on a horse, you know? And and there's this picture of the man of the house sitting on a chair in front of the fireplace and he's just weeping, repenting before God. And the wife has got her hand on his shoulder and the preacher's got his hand on the other shoulder and the kids are at the footstool. America was repenting of its sin. There was great revival in this country. Christianity was taking hold. And as I mentioned, the courts would declare in 1892, this is truly a Christian nation. You see, I give God the glory for all the things that he did in bringing us to that point. And as I look around us on this Sunday morning, between the first service and the second service, I recognize that you're here today because you want to be. We live in a free country. There's no one that's forced you to come to church. Isn't that awesome? You could be doing other things. And there are many people who are doing other things. But the church of Jesus Christ is not dead in America. The church of Jesus Christ is you, however. It's me. And together we need to seek the Lord once more. Because God who has done great things is worthy to be praised. And from one generation to the next, let us sing the praises of God Almighty. And I would put in this category of the things that God has done, the establishment of this nation. It drives people crazy today, the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. It drives them crazy. Because it's based upon God's word. And every single word of it was thought through from a biblical perspective. And for that, I praise God. Let's pray. God, we give you praise and thanks for what you have done. We think of Jesus, our Savior, who came to this world and died upon the cross. Gave his life so that we might have life. Father, truly, we are a blessed people. And Lord, how I pray that if there's anyone here this morning who's yet to place their faith in Jesus, that today they would be the day where they would call upon the name of the Lord and be saved, knowing that faith in Jesus is what saved them. Not their good works, not their personalities, not the things that they've accomplished, but Jesus alone. And Father, help us as Christians to be emboldened in our faith. Help us, Father, to sing the praises of Jesus, sing the praises of the things that God has done in our nation. For we give you praise and thanks for making this day possible, a day when we, in the freedoms in which we enjoy, allow us to come and worship. May we never tire of singing your praise for our freedom. And may you be glorified through the lives of Christians in America and the world today. For it's in Christ's name we pray it. Amen.